welcome back to Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian at the European Parliament in Brussels. My guest is David McAllister, the head of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. He comes from Germany, but as his name suggests, he is partly Scottish. From 2010 to 2013, he was Prime Minister of the state of Lower Saxony, Germany's fourth most populous state, and he has been described as a rising star of the centre-right CDU party. He took over the European Parliament's foreign affairs body in February from fellow Christian Democrat Elmar Brock, ensuring a continued link to German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who herself was re-elected this September. Uh, very good to have you on the programme, Mr McAllister. Thank you. Let's start with uh, the Catalan crisis. Uh, do you think the EU's current stance of not intervening is working, or is it time to dare a new approach? This is an internal Spanish conflict uh, with two sides, the central government in Madrid and the regional government in Barcelona. And this must be sorted out within the framework of a Spanish constitution and within the framework of a Spanish state. I mean, I have heard some calls for the EU to uh, some kind of facilitate a dialogue uh, in this case, but this could only happen if both sides would unanimously ask the European Commission, and the Spanish government hasn't done this and they won't do it. Mm. But there are other examples of negotiations where the two sides didn't want to talk. I mean, I suppose the most obvious one is Israel-Palestine, and there you had foreign envoys coming in, talking separately to the two sides and eventually bringing them together to at least a trilateral f format. Do you think that could work? I mean, why not try something like that? Well, once again, the European Union can only be active if both sides agree mm. on us getting involved in this internal Spanish conflict. And the central government, Prime Minister Rajoy, has been very clear that he doesn't wish this. So it's a very theoretical uh, debate uh, in the moment. And uh, we also follow a policy of non-involvement in domestic issues in the European Union. And I'm surprised that the same people who, in the European Parliament, call for the European Commission not to interfere in domestic issues. I hear calling for the European Commission to be active. Of course, the current situation, though, is strengthening Mr Rajoy more than Mr Puigdemont because the Spanish Prime Minister knows that he has this strong uh, EU support, so he doesn't need to come to the negotiating table, in a sense. Do you think that's a, that's a problem in the dynamic? This conflict can only be solved through the instrument of dialogue. Both sides have to talk to each other, and I think both sides are sending out first signals that they want to find a compromise, they want to find a solution. But I agree with the Spanish central government that whatever the solution is, it can only be based on the Spanish constitution and on the Spanish legal system. How worried are you about uh, a possible domino effect. This is something that a member of Mr Rajoy's ruling party has mentioned. Of course, uh, he has a particular interest in saying that, but uh, he was saying we could one day see a Europe of many states if Catalonian independence actually goes ahead. Are you concerned about that, or do you think Catalonia is really uh, a case uh, of its own? Well, in the moment, Catalonia is a case of its own. Uh, we had the question of a possible Scottish independence in 2014, but I don't see other separatist movements going that far, like the provincial government uh, in Catalonia. But another argument against an involvement of the EU or the EU Commission is that here, of course, this could be a precedence for other cases. If the EU starts negotiating here, facilitating a dialogue, there could be similar calls coming from Northern Italy, from Flanders and Belgium, or from Corsica and France. And honestly, I understand the wish of people having strong regions in Europe, and I strongly believe in a Europe of nations and with strong regions. For instance, Germany being a country with 16 Bundesländer, we have strong regions, but strong regions is something different than having separatist movements. I don't believe that Europe will be successful if we fall into a dozen of new states. You mentioned Scotland, and there's some confusion at the moment as to when Scotland might hold a second referendum on Scottish independence. Is there a sense here in Brussels that Scotland is now cherry-picking? That's to say, if the Brexit deal is 
OK for Scotland, it will say, fine, we'll stay in the UK outside the EU. If it's not OK at that point, we'll try and join the EU. Is that a problem at the moment for, uh, for, uh, in terms of Scotland's position here? Well, the relationship between Scotland and the United Kingdom is a domestic British issue. And in 2014, the EU was completely neutral in the question of Scottish independence or not. And the referendum was agreed between both sides, between Edinburgh and London. The British constitution sees that possibility of a referendum and both sides agreed. This is the main difference between the situation in Catalonia and Spain, where the Spanish constitution doesn't see this possibility and the Spanish government wouldn't agree to a legally binding referendum. Um, the situation in Scotland is, as I understand it, that the Prime Minister hasn't ruled out the possibility of another referendum in Scotland, but she's been very clear that this certainly will not happen before uh, Brexit has actually uh, taken place. So we will have to just wait and see uh, what this happens, uh, uh, what, what, what this means for the United Kingdom. You don't think then it would be a problem for Scotland to, uh, as it were, rejoin the European Union if that referendum were held only after Brexit actually happens? Well, the UK joined the European Union or the European communities in 1973 as a whole, and the United Kingdom will leave uh, the European Union as a whole, yeah. probably on the 29th of March 2019. But to be honest, I yeah. deeply regret uh, this decision. I'm a German politician with <laughs> British roots. Um, I still yeah. have close contacts to the United Kingdom. I just feel sorry uh, for the country and for the British people because in the end, the consequences for leaving the European Union will be negative because if you leave, our family of nations, you can't be in a better position than before. But we have to face reality. I think what is important is that we get this divorce, a divorce we didn't ask for, that we get it done. We have to get it done in an orderly manner. What would it take to achieve a breakthrough in the talks, do you think? Well, we need substantial progress on the details of the British withdrawal, and this sufficient progress hasn't been achieved, and that's why I welcome the decision of the heads of government not to start the second phase of the negotiations. We'll have to wait and see if we can now get this done at the next European Council in December. But on the three main issues, the financial obligations, the Irish-Northern Irish border question, and the rights, the legal rights of citizens, uh, we still have a lot of homework to do. And um, I mean, I'm trying to be as objective as possible, mm. but what the British side has presented until now isn't enough. So you agree with the Commission's position that these aspirations that Theresa May has expressed in the Florence speech and in the House of Commons and so on, that needs to still be converted into a more concrete negotiating position. So basically the onus is on Britain at this point. The Prime Minister's speech in Florence was helpful. I think it set a different tone. And what I was told was that the last negotiation round was also in a better tone, in a better mood as the ones before. But it's not about tone, it's about sufficient progress, and that hasn't been um, achieved. And that's why I don't, only agree, I don't only agree with the Commission position, I also agree with the Parliament's position, because we were the first ones to say it right already at the beginning of October that we can't see a way how we can start the second phase of the negotiations in the moment. But the clock is ticking. The UK will presumably leave the European Union on the 29th of March 2019 at midnight. If we want to reach this date, we will have to conclude the negotiations on a technical level in October 2018. So this leaves us exactly now with 12 months, not only to negotiate the British withdrawal, but also to negotiate at least the some of the cornerstones of the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. For me, it is obvious that without a transitional period, this won't be possible. So the solution will be that the UK leaves the EU, the single market, the customs union, on the 29th of March 2019, but we will then need a longer period so that we can then adopt all the necessary legal amendments which are necessary. I'd like to come on to some of the other events that are, have happened recently, particularly in your neighbourhood, if I can put it like that. Um, the German election, which saw uh, the alternative for Germany, the Populist Party, gain around 13%, and, of course, a strong showing for the Austrian Freedom Party in the parliamentary election there this October. Um, do you think that... Uh, are you, uh, do you think Angela Merkel, once she actually forms this next coalition, is going to be facing a more Eurosceptic environment? Well, first of all, the German people 
declared their democratic will on the 24th of September, and we have to accept this. Mm. And political parties, responsible political parties, are ready to actually shoulder responsibility. I believe that political parties should always run an election to try and get into government to get as much as possible from their manifesto uh, through. Uh, what I found irritating and actually disappointing was that the German Social Democrats declared a few minutes after the polls had been closed that they were not ready to go into any kind of government again and they would now go into, uh, into the opposition. I thought that was dis a disappointing move, which I don't understand. Well, if you look at the results of the SPD in Lower Saxony, the, uh, the regional election there, you were Prime Minister of that state. They actually did quite well, didn't they? So maybe it was a smart move to go into opposition. Well, no, but the, the regional elections in Niedersachsen uh, had, of course, also some impact from the federal level, but it was mainly based on regional issues, and mm. that's a different story. So, anyhow, yeah. my party, the Christian Democratic Union, is ready to go into government. Uh, Angela Merkel has won a national election for the fourth time in a row, which is a very seldom uh, event in, in a Western democracy, and we now will try and form a government with the Liberals and the Greens. This is something new. For the first time, three political parties will be negotiating a coalition. That's different. Until, until now, it was always two-party coalitions. And for the first time, with the CDU, CSU, the Liberals and the Greens, we have three parties who have cooperated on a local level and at a regional level in Germany, but not at a federal level. So the coalition negotiations will be challenging. Mm. Uh, there might be some uh, surprises. Uh, hopefully, we can conclude them before Christmas, but nobody can give you a guarantee in the moment. There's a wing of the Green Party which really does not want a cap on asylum seekers. At the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have uh, the sister part of the CSU in Bavaria pulling in quite the opposite direction uh, with uh, a new Austrian uh, situation just across the border as well, if I might add. I think you have to differentiate between legal migration to Germany and uh, our economy is still doing well. We have a record unemployment low. Germany is dependent on qualified workers coming from other countries in certain fields to help improve our economy. So on the one hand, we need channels for working migration to Germany, but in those fields which are beneficial for our economy and beneficial for our country. And on the other hand, we have a humanitarian responsibility for asylum seekers, for refugees, for people who are fleeing from war and prosecution, uh, civil war and other things. So we have to differentiate these two. Often in German politics, things are muddled up. And on the humanitarian side, Germany has shown responsibility. We will show responsibility, but of course, the situation of 2015, when several hundred thousand people came within a few months to Germany, this is an exceptional challenge which won't be able to repeat itself uh, um, uh, again. I strongly believe that in the long run we will need a European border and a European coast guard to protect our external borders in Europe together. But border control is, of course, one area that uh, Germany will be able to work with the French president, Emmanuel Macron, quite closely, but he's also outlined some uh, very far-reaching ideas about Eurozone integration. Do you think with the prospect of the Liberals in Germany, perhaps, we don't know yet, but perhaps holding the finance ministry, is it basically wishful thinking what Emmanuel Macron has been saying? I think we have heard two very important speeches on the future of Europe in the last few weeks. The one, the State of the Union speech, from, uh, uh, by Jean-Claude Juncker in the European Parliament and President Macron. And I've had a closer look at both speeches and I would identify at least 80, perhaps 90%, uh, where I would say, this is OK. So it's a very few details which you might have a different view in Germany as a Christian Democrat or a Liberal or uh, if you're uh, coming from France. On the future of the Eurozone, we agree that we have to reform the Eurozone because we have a joint interest that our currency, the euro, remains a stable and sustainable currency. And we all know that the economic and monetary union uh, hasn't been completed. And I think we should be thankful that President Macron has made some concrete proposals. And now let's see what goes and what not goes. One thing is clear, 
A mutualization of debts is something which Germany cannot agree upon. This was not only in the manifesto of the Liberals, this was also in the manifesto, for instance, of my political party. That is something which we can't do, but I think we can kind of perhaps develop the European stability mechanism forward into whatever kind of monetary fund. But there's one point which I would like to make clear. We shouldn't discuss so much creating new institutions, a Eurozone government, a Eurozone parliament, but we should be using the existing institutions of the Euro. And that's why I was thankful that Jean-Claude Juncker pointed out the Euro is the currency of the European Union, not the currency only of the Eurozone. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for being uh, my guest, David McAllister, the uh, chair of the European Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee. That's all for this edition of Talking Europe. Don't go away. More news is coming up shortly here on France 24. We have a new initiative at The Observers. The Observers take action. Ordinary people around the world who have concrete ideas and projects to make their part of the world a better place. It could be for the environment. It could be for education. Or to improve the society they live in. If you know of someone in your community who's working to make a difference, let us know.